I'm such a small person and I have three companies. There are also tax planning reasons. There are also reasons of fundraising. Today, if I have to raise money in a particular company, I'll use one company for a particular asset. In infrastructure, you need multiple assets. And person in income tax means anybody right from individual to a company to a partnership firm to a cooperative society. Everybody is a called a person. So it is very clear. I can use tax planning tools and which Adani is doing. In past, even Ambani was doing. At one point of time, Ambani was accused that you're making so much of profits and you're not paying tax because he was using all the benefits he was getting under section 80 hhc uh, then 80 ia and all those and he was not paying tax <laughs>
notes to the accounts, which is part of the annual report. And that was being claimed as if this is something which is totally new. Of course, I'm not supporting Adani. I'm neither opposing Adani. Adani has made a presentation. They have given the whole report and rebuttal. Now it is upon Hindenburg and others to provide documents and data to say that whatever they have made accusations against Adani are true. And thereafter, it is upon the government to then look into it. But one of the biggest allegation which has stuck on to Adani and which was being discussed for a very long time was the huge leverage that Adani was taking, which was in form of loans that it had taken. Now, here we have to understand that infrastructure companies, infrastructure projects are long gestation projects and they are heavy physical investments, assets being created. So in such a case, the loan is also on a higher side and that is a prudential financial practice that any infrastructure company can take more loan. Of course, Adani has taken more loan than NHPC and others in the green energy segment. It has taken more loans than other companies in the power segment. But then it is about the risk-bearing capacity of the group and the investors know about it. It is not that it is something hidden. It is totally coming in the balance sheet. It is disclosed. And the loans were taken to create assets. It was not like loans were taken to uh, run the losses or to fund the losses of the company. And against that, they had huge physical assets. And if you look at the composition of loans, the rhetoric was that, oh, if something happens to Adani, then, you know, Indian banks will go bust and Indian banks will face a problem. But nearly 40% of the loan was taken from international markets in form of bond issues. And who subscribes to these bonds? These are big institutional investors. Institutional investors are something like the mutual funds in India. In US, there are various debt funds, there are hedge funds who invest in uh, such securities so that they can get a bit of a higher return than whatever. Because you know, in America and other places, the interest rates are very low. So the hyper narrative which was created, the propaganda which was done that, oh my God, this is a dangerous thing. That did not hold any grounds. And it was a very wrongly manipulated information which was sent across to the people. That was how a whole propaganda machinery was created, be it in form of a Hindenburg report or be it in form of a narrative which was spread by mainstream media to vilify Adani that they have huge loans, they may go bankrupt. And which is not the case. I'll digress for a minute or so, but there was a report in Bloomberg that the bonds, Adani bonds on uh, international markets, that is US markets crashed because everybody had a feeling that Adani will go bankrupt the way Evergrande happened in China, the real estate company. And thereafter, the bonds again rebounds because everybody realized that there is no problem in Adani group per se in the core businesses. The core business is cement. Cement till people can continue to build houses, till Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana construction continues, till the roads are being built, till the ports are being built, till the airports are being built, cement is required. So there is no dearth of demand uh, no problem in the demand for cement. That cement businesses will close down. Till Indian economy is doing good, the port or ships will come on Mundra port and there will be business. So port business is also not going to fail. Airport business, they have Bombay and other six, uh, five airports. People are going to fly. We are the third largest flying nation now. So till we continue to fly, Adani is going to get money. The day we stop flying, Adani is in a problem. So there is also no problem. People keep on uh, using uh, edible oil, fortune and all for cooking. If you stop using oil and become diet conscious, again, Adani is in a problem. Okay, there is coal required to run power plants. They are again into coal trading. So there is no problem. So per se, all the allegations that the business will go bust and Adani companies will go bust and the loans will go bad and the banks will be in problem was a hoax which was created. And after realizing that this is a hoax, the bond markets in US also was stable and Adani bonds prices also jumped up. Now in international market, where do they have any uh, exposure? They are into coal mining in Australia. They have Colombo port, which was acquired last year. They have bid for power projects in Sri Lanka to curtail the rise of China. They have they recently uh, bagged the Haifa port in Israel. They are now working on SEZ in Egypt on the Suez Canal. What are they doing? They are countering the rise of China. China had a project called as Belt and Road Initiative in which they created a string of pearls across India to counter India and to nail India. 
India came out with a strategy that, okay, you are working on this. I'll come out with a counter uh, game and I'll use Adani to counter your rise. So we went into Sri Lanka. We are now count countering China over there. We bagged Hyperport against in which China was betting, was bagging and we bet it, uh, you know, we got it against China. In SEZ, with, in Suez, we'll also have a, uh, have a control over the one of the major trade routes which con connects India and Europe and US. So that is a very big win for us. It's a diplomatic win as well and for which we need a financial muscle. So that has also helped us. And is it that only India is doing it? No. I share before you can see on the slide, I'll share a personal experience. See, I was advising a large transnational Indian conglomerate on their projects in Maldives and Sri Lanka. And we, when we were talking to uh, the Maldivian authorities, there was a Chinese company who came in. And we were in the process of raising funds for that particular project. Chinese company came, they saw the project, housing project in Maldives in a, a suburb called Hulu Malay, whereas we had, our client had a project in Malay. Within 15 days, the same Chinese company comes back to Maldives with the deputy foreign minister, deputy finance minister, and the chairman of the Exim Bank of China. They meet all the top guys, the president, housing minister, this, that, they are comfortable with the country, everything. They go back within 15 days, they come and they sign the agreement. And in another one month, all the financing is closed. Whereas we in India were struggling for more than two and a half, three months only to close the financing from Exim Bank, which we did not get. When, and the corporate is very big. I don't want to name without their permission. But such a big corporate that banks would be ready to lend. But we did not have the line of credit with the, the Maldives because of which the loan was not given. So what does it show? It shows that the Chinese government was very proactive in ensuring that Chinese companies get access to Maldivian market. Chinese companies get access to Sri Lankan market. They get access to all the markets so that it can you know, expand its influence into smaller countries, into third world countries. And this is not new. Even US does it. You can see it on the screen that big tech like Google, Facebook, Twitter, all these companies are used by US to influence democracies, influence the people, turn it in a manner where it can be used to impress upon the elections. And what happens? Can we take action against Google, Facebook and Twitter? Not really. Can we ban it? No. Why? Because it is the US government, the US state, which is standing behind these companies to ensure that these companies don't face problem in any markets. Similarly, in US companies also pressurize smaller countries to allow evergreening of patents. Now, what is evergreening of patents? Normally, patent is for a 15 to 25 years period that there is an exclusivity. If you develop a molecule to treat a particular disease, you have an exclusive right for 15 to 25 years to recover money from it, earn profit, and thereafter it becomes a generic product which anybody can manufacture. But US government goes an extra mile to ensure that in that US companies can use evergreening so that, uh, of patents so that they can continue to charge a very high price in third world countries and earn more profits, for which it uses all the arm twisting techniques. They use IPR regime to ensure that countries cannot move the patented products after the uh, uh, when it uh, goes off patent into the generic category, it has to again push it into the patented category. Only India is a country which has stood back against uh, US. And to give you a very realistic example, very recent, we saw what happened during the COVID time. American companies were not even ready to share the tech, uh, IPR and the patents uh, with anyone else. They wanted to earn money themselves. They did not even look at the humanitarian angle that there are people who are dying. No, we want to make money. And who stood behind them? America. When raw material had to come to India, to Serum Institute, America stopped it. Why? Because they use this as an arm twisting technique. That if you don't give Moderna or uh, Pfizer access to India, we will not give you medicine, raw material. So every country does this. Rather, this is the way countries work. Companies are a extended poly foreign policy arm of the governments. Okay, and we have seen that even with uh, China, they uh, invested in a railroad in Kazakhstan, 
when the railroad did not generate revenue chinese company took over the gold mine in kazakhstan so is it a chinese company who has taken it no it is the chinese government who has taken it so this is how it works be it in kenya be it in other countries this is the same case so why is there a attack on adani first it is not a attack on adani it is a attack on india it is attack on india's ambitions of becoming a global player it is a attack on india to say the show india that boss you know don't jump we know your limit we will show you down we'll pull you down we'll break you and that is the intent of this whole attack on adani why because india was flexing muscles india refused to become a slave of america and side with america in the russo ukraine war we have seen that india has remained neutral it did not side with russia it did not side with america it criticized russia for aggression but did not become a puppet of america in sanctioning russia very interestingly we kept on buying oil from russia at a very low price and maybe whatever you call it the banya buddhi or whatever indian refineries were importing russian crude oil which was at a discount of 30 35% we were processing and manufacturing products and we were exporting it to america at market prices and in the process indian government earned a huge amount of tax revenue in form of windfall tax windfall tax was because india's foreign policy was used to benefit a few companies and against that indian government said that if you are earning it is because of the government's intervention so you have to pay a tax that money has to go for the welfare of the people and so we charged indian government charged a windfall tax and only two companies were manufacturing and exporting to us and they paid taxes and india earned a huge amount of money out of it okay so this is how we earn money now this is not something that us will like so us is using all the techniques see i'll remind you one thing over here kissinger henry kissinger he is one of the biggest and the most knowledgeable person in the international relations and the diplomacy area and he was the national security advisor to american presidents and he made a statement that being a enemy of america is dangerous being a friend is lethal so if you are a friend of america you are getting destroyed if you are enemy they will anyways destroy you we have seen what they did to saddam hussein what they did to gaddafi we have seen what they have done to many other third world country where they had their own dictators so america did not accept anyone becoming larger than them and if we have to say in hindi aankhon se aank lada ke dekhna okay they did not accept anyone with that kind of spirit especially india because what we see from 1947 to 2014 was a government which was very meek which did not have a stand which did not have a spine they always succumb to the pressures of all the countries be it russia be it usa be it uk everywhere including pakistan the worst is that the congress governments even succumb to pakistan forget us us is a nuclear power uk is a nuclear power russia was a nuclear is a nuclear power soviet union was a ally so we had to succumb to them but even pakistan against that india is standing still strong and determined so that is why india uh, us is not liking it of course china is not bound to like it and us has learned one very big mis- uh, thing from the mistake it made with china us allowed china to grow very strong and today china has become the second largest market economy on whose back of on back of us market henry kissinger visited china in 1971 it was one of the most famous visits by a american into china and the then chinese premier welcomed in him and thereafter the american president went over there and thereafter america started shifting its manufacturing to china and china became such a big global manufacturing powerhouse but america did not envision that china will become so big that at one point of time it will start staring and you know threatening us and having ambitions of becoming a global superpower displacing america and that is why america has learned that now if they are allowing any other country to grow they should create social strife they should create problems in that country so that that country doesn't really become very big like china to become a threat for us so that pe- investors are scared and the whole fundraising process is sabotaged 
it was also to create a distrust against adani amongst bankers and financial institutions which you have seen because all the banks and financial institutions said that we are going to have a investigation rbi had to come out with a statement that everything is well and then two people said that rbi governor shaktikanta das is wrong and adani is a fraud and the banks are defrauded okay there is a demand for gpc that there should be a gpc and politicians who don't know anything about finance except for a handful they have started talking about finance as if they are the finance experts and they know how to make excel sheets and financial models and understand ltv and everything this is what is the reason for this see i come from a stock market background i started in the stock market at the age of 16 okay after my 10th standard exam i started working in stock market when you stop a company from raising funds that companies when you block that company's fundraising capability then that company cannot raise money it cannot grow today if adani has to buy other three four or ports has to invest in other countries where is it going to get money from it has to get money from the market so you stop the water pipeline nal band kar do you stop the water flowing so that the uh, adani is totally dried out of funds so that it cannot grow so that stops the strategic objective of the government of india to expand into other countries it is also to create a suspicion in the minds of the people that lic and sbi are being arm twisted by government of india to give money to adani group in turn people will not trust lic and sbi we have seen a lot of political rhetoric oh your money is not safe in lic so that people will not give money to lic and that is how lic can also be targeted and destroyed sbi can be targeted and destroyed they wanted people to rush to the banks and withdraw the money but that did not happen this has we have seen it in the past with a few banks that there were rumors of bankruptcy and people went and you know broke their fds that did not happen in this case so there is a lot of confidence amongst the people about the government and the financial institutions under this particular government and their intent was to cause a meltdown in the financial markets in the indian markets which will hurt the investors and this is not something that i am alone saying yesterday supreme court has also observed it in its uh, observations in the supreme court itself that the intention of this hammering we call it hammering of the stocks is to hurt the retail investors and to create losses for the retail investors we have not lost money chalo adani lost 7 and a half 8 lakh crore rupees understandable it's adani's money but what about another 3 3 and a half lakh crore which ordinary investors lost me and you lost when this kind of losses happen what happens is there is a huge fall or disturbance caused and that results in investor sentiment confidence and business confidence getting shaken this in turn has a trickle down or a rather cascading effect because when there is no investors confidence business confidence goes down people will not buy more people will not invest in new projects so there will be a economic slowdown and this is what these people wanted by virtue of this particular report that there should be economic slowdown imagine one year before the election if there is a economic slowdown okay and i am telling you we have still people have not realized the impact of this whole game will be seen in january february next year we are still not yet over we are not it is not yet done this is a huge implication which we'll see from december january february of next year on the eve of elections and i will advise everyone to now very closely look at the economic indicators and the markets and the way markets are being played around and the way indian companies are targeted it is not just india uh, just adani there will be other companies also who will be scared so what is this all about this is called as fifth generation warfare fifth generation warfare is a technique in which you don't have to fire a bullet you don't have to fly a aircraft over the enemy territory you don't have to send a single missile into the enemy territory and you can defeat the enemy it is known as non kinetic military force and what are the techniques the technique is our social and communal strife riots war we have seen that at chingu border we have seen it in shahin bagh okay we have seen it on 26 january when the khalistanis came and uh, came to red fort and we all know what they did this is in form of activism to stall development in name of environment human rights children rights so in environment manner in the name of environment we have seen how starlight project was stalled india was a net exporter of copper from there we become a net importer of copper we lost thousands of crores of rupees only because china wanted to ensure that the copper inventory that it has 
can be liquidated at a good price for which they uh, they paid money to indian activists and they destroyed india's economy at least a part of it we saw the same in case of ra in the past we have seen that in narmada bachao andolan okay so this is one angle the human rights angle that the human rights problem will not deal with you till now we have not seen this happen to us but it can be done in the future because we are seeing lot of amis amnesty uh, and others talking about it children rights now this is a very big play in which even the carpet industry of india has been affected carpets are not allowed to be exported into us and uh, uh, us is not allowing it europe is not allowing it because they are saying that your carpets are made by children of course there can be laws but you know this is to stop the whole import of a particular sector then we have seen hacking of sensitive websites and servers we saw aims and all those that is also part of fifth generation warfare and then my favorite part that is the attack on the financial markets which is what they did with adani and see this is not new in 1992 job soros did the same thing to bank of england rather the day after fpo when the fpo successful and i saw 800 rupees drop in adani enterprises price i realized that this is a manufactured thing somebody is playing on this and the first person to came in come in my mind is the great gentleman named george soros because he did the same to bank of england adani is nothing when you can target a bank of england which is the central bank the reserve bank of uh, of uk then you can destroy any economy that he did in 1992 by hammering pound sterling and then in 1997 he did the same thing to Re malaysian ringgit because uh, sorry uh, 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 to ringgit and because of it the bank also uh, malaysia was also hurt okay there is a typing mistake it was island is a typing mistake apologies for that so this is how the things happen everywhere and this is how the financial markets are used to destabilize the economy and that is why i'm saying the impact will be seen next year or at the end of this year because this is going to hurt a lot of financial processes now there will be questions on sbi on lic and all that how are they working what are they doing how are they doing all those kind of things okay and then that will limit their ability to lend money we have seen that in the past during the upa tenure lic had given loans to 2g companies and in a wrong manner and there were raids in lic and thereafter lic's processes became very stricter but now lic will be afraid even the government will be afraid because god knows what kind of new controversy can come in so what it comes to is the, the last slide that what is next for india first thing is this is a lot time today it is adani tomorrow it can be some other company any company which is close to government of india any company which works closely with the government of india on expanding the strategic interest of indian government outside india becoming of extended foreign policy arm of the government of india all those companies will be other under targets so this is the last slide that this kind of attacks will continue because this kind of uh, structured products to hammer indian markets have now got a front door entry into india through p notes and this hammering was done using structured product derivatives on american markets and the other leg is in india so this will continue we cannot stop it because we are now integrated into the international financial markets however we'll have to work on a very stronger financial intelligence create a deterrent so that foreign players and foreign governments and other antagonistic forces cannot play against us rbi sebi stock exchanges and other regulators will have to become more stronger in terms of disclosure market regulations to ensure that this kind of manipulations don't happen in the market so this is very important for us to ensure that in future there is no second adani which is happening and people think that it will only be indian companies no it can also be indian rupee indian rupee can be hammered to the level that if indian rupee becomes roughly 150 rupees to a dollar what happens to inflation what happens to fuel prices you know cooking gas prices and petrol prices will shoot up the roof at 200 250 rupees for petrol and maybe 1000 or uh, 2000 rupees for uh, cooking gas immediately there will be a uproar and outrage in india and it will have political ramifications for the ruling government so in such a situation indian government will now have to work on having experts in intelligence who are financial experts who can identify this kind of things and stop it from happening so with this i'd like to end my discussion so thank you very much sangam talks and uh, can we open it up for questions if anyone has any 
नमस्ते सर सो सर माय क्वेश्चन वाज दैट द रिपोर्ट दैट दिस हिंडनबर्ग हैज साइटेड सो देयर वाज अ थिंग एज प्रोमोटर शेयर प्लेजिंग सो कैन यू थ्रो सम लाइट ऑन दैट मींस इज दिस एन इलीगल प्रैक्टिस और हाउ मच इट इट कैन बी टॉलरेटेड व्हाट शुड बी द एग्जैक्ट रेशियो ऑफ दैट नो नो देयर इज नथिंग इलीगल सी इवन आई डू लोन अगेंस्ट शेयर्स what happens is promoter share placement or that two angles first thing is when government or when the promoter needs to raise money in the company what he does is he has his own shares now company say assuming adani has 75% shares and 25% shares are in the market and he wants to raise money he says ke i will put my loans uh, my shares as mortgage instead of company assets and raise money in the company if anything goes wrong it will be the promoter who will be hurt and not the company okay because people will want to break uh, you know will want to lenders will want to sell promoter shares that is adani shares but they have shown it in a very negative light again they say that it is hidden it is not hidden it was you know after 2008 it was actually disclosed in the balance sheets also it was disclosed on sebi website uh, on stock exchanges that how much of the shares are pledged so that is you know that is a perfectly market practice there is nothing wrong in it another thing sir this current uh, current ratio if you see that they have shown that many of them are below one so is it is it fine with uh, with a company means they are working in some uh, construction the current company. ratio of less than one is not really a very healthy sign it also shows the over trading element in the company uh, which from a financial practice is a bit of a riskier thing but again uh, you know where do you get this current ratio you divide the current assets by current liabilities to get a current ratio and current ratio of less than 1 means that current assets are more uh, are less than current liabilities okay so it is very much clear in the financial statement rather all the investors all the people who are tracking adani balance sheets be it for investing purpose or for academic purpose or for lending purpose okay they knew about it it was not something which was hidden rather this was even discussed in uh, you know when we all stock market guys whether we have invested or not when we would sit over our drinks and discuss about companies because this is a normal practice in stock market that three four five friends will meet will discuss balance sheets of the companies when i was doing ca every saturday we used to have a session wherein every article club one article club would analyze the whole balance sheet and uh, financials and make a presentation in the office so that is how the chartered accountant students were trained on analyzing balance sheets so this is nothing new yeah probably for the non finance guys it is something new but for us it is something that we learned in the first year of training and everybody knew it everybody knew it not a single person who was ignorant about it everybody knew it i am sorry i missed the first earlier part of your discussion i would like like what you said in the end that uh, about the dollar and about the inflation and that it could have political ramifications my question is about the political aspect of this because today rahul gandhi was on a tirade against adani agni veer everything and he says adani jis mein bhi jis itne sare business mein ghus jate hain jis marzi business mein ghus jate hain har ek mein successful hain i wanted to ask him that four generations of his family haven't ever worked how come they are so successful but uh, i would like you to talk about the political angle to this see first thing is uh, rahul gandhi has been making this kind of statements for a very long time the left has been making this kind of statements for a very long time my simple question when telecom sector was opened which company in mobile telephony had exp- experience none bharti entered they had no experience reliance entered they had no experience when nehru became the prime minister he had no experience so you know and rahul gandhi even now doesn't have any experience when we opened aviation sector damania airways was the first eastern west was the one they had no experience when any sector opens up there are companies who don't have experience but they build their experience when petrochemical sector was opened who was the first company it was dhirubhai ambani and reliance who started the polymer manufacturing they had no experience they have become big okay and this is not just with india when mark zuckerberg entered into the tech uh, big tech sector he had no experience google had no experience facebook had no experience but they all worked on it what we have in india is this is all i see it as a paid targeted attack on indian enterprise that they don't have experience then what experience did twitter have see we have you know this is a nehruvian idea and the leftist idea to vilify indian enterprise they will destroy indian enterprise saying they don't have experience okay serum institute and uh, bharat biotech had no experience in manufacturing covid vaccines they manufactured okay 
Apollo Hospitals never had an experience in running. Rather, it is the first uh, large-scale hospital company in the country. And they came out with one of the best hospitals. Rather, government could not do anything in the public health sector. And it was Apollo who did it in the private sector. Government acquired Air India and Hindustan Aeronautics. Did it have any experience in uh, running uh, airlines or manufacturing aeroplanes? What happened? Rather, these are all statements which are made to destroy the country so that we don't have any private enterprise and our people cannot become entrepreneurs. Today, we have so many unicorns. Which unicorn? If a unicorn is a company which has a valuation of more than, of more than a billion dollars, which is around 8,500. Which unicorn has experience? None. They're all new companies. They're startups. And then too, if they're having, then Rahul Gandhi is the only one who doesn't have experience and keeps on talking. There are small, younger people, half his age or two-thirds his age, who are raising and making a 8,000 crore rupee, 9,000 crore rupee company. And Rahul Gandhi is sitting over there. Nika, Nika, did they have any experience in... Uh, and, you know, all the women today, uh, you know, uh, take an oath on, on, uh, on Nika for giving them the best of the foreign brands. Did anyone have experience in that? Nobody had. So this is a very fake thing that person does not have experience. Despite not having experience... When Adani created Mundra port today, it is the one of the best ports. Whereas the PSU ports, be it JNPT or be it Tutikorin and all, we see how they are mismanaged. Whereas Adani is running one of the best ports. You invite any naval guy, any merchant navy guy who has seen 100 ports across the world and tell them to compare Adani. He will say that it is at par with Rotterdam and Amsterdam ports. Okay. Whereas Indian government who talks about or the Nehru family and their steons who work with the bureaucrats, they could not create any world scale capabilities anywhere. So I think these kind of statements are very juvenile. Okay. And only Rahul Gandhi can make this kind of statements uh, because his IQ is less than the IQ of uh, temperature at, Arct uh, at Arctic and at Antarctic region. I also have a question. While you did talk about the legal aspects of things, like, you know, similarly, like the way uh, the budget came out and the way that it's been talked about, uh, you can see how it's been so politicized. But actually, when you come down to talking about it or criticizing it, people don't have concrete points, even for the sake of just countering it. So while that may be legal, that may not be ethical. So on the Hindenburg side, you can see that they are a short seller company. How ethical is it? Of course, it's legal, but how ethical is it? And secondly, even though the promoter, uh, the pledge promoting has gone down uh, a lot for Adani company, like I think it was 54 back in 2020. And now uh, I think by the end of 2022, it was 17%. Even though that is legal, how ethical are both those things on either side of the camp? See, first thing is short selling is not wrong. Rather, my friend, he's a stockbroker. And he advised his clients and many of his clients sold Adani Enterprises at 3,800 levels. Short selling is not wrong. If I believe that a particular share is overvalued and the price has to come down, then I am supposed to sell if I have a confidence in my own sale. So nothing wrong in that. The real question is the methodology used by Hindenburg. And I'll quote Southern New York District Court who said that Adani's, uh, sorry, uh, Hindenburg's report on, uh, 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 you know, Draft King, there was a company named Draft King. It cannot be taken at purely face value because the intent of Hindenburg is to earn money by creating suspicions and hammering. He may be right or wrong in his allegations. That is upon the companies to prove or the courts to prove, which Adani is now going to the court in US. And Hindenburg has not given any private information or sensitive information, which is uh, which we don't know of. He has used all the public uh, information to create a perception and, uh, you know, that Adani is wrong. I'm not saying Adani is totally right as one of the questions about the leverage was uh, asked about the current ratio, which is a concern because when we as finance management teachers or as professionals teach our young, uh, you know, juniors or students, that 2 is to 1 is the ideal ratio. So Adani also has, he is a high risk player. People need to know it, but he has shown it. It's not that he has hidden it. But Hindenburg's intent of making money by creating a perception, second thing is this report, if I see very clearly, as a chartered accountant, when I see, this is nothing in it. All aspersions, some things which are cooked beyond, yani, you know, raite ko tadka diya hai, or salad mein dahi dala hai, if I have to put it in very simple language to give an analogy. And the intent, uh, this report, according to me, seeing the language and everything, Hindenburg ne naam diya hai ya thoda kaam, some work has been done by Hindenburg 
This report largely looks like manufactured in India by some forces in India who don't want the country to grow or Adani to be heard so that the message is sent to the corporate sector that don't be close to Modi, otherwise you will also be screwed. The report language, see, in the past, there was section 397, 398 of Companies Act, which was used for corporate blackmailing. So people will read the balance sheet, create some ruckus and all that and try to extract some money from promoters of the company. Okay, that is now section 241 to 244 of the Companies Act 2013. So when I read this, I find that there's more of that blackmailing kind of report, which is made public to create aspersions and hurt the stock price so that Hindenburg can make money. To a particular extent, I am with Hindenburg saying that if he has released the report, he also has his skin in the game because he has shorted the shares. But the way the ecosystem is created to ensure that Hindenburg makes money, and I don't think it is only Hindenburg, there will be many other people in India who would also have gone short including some political parties who can raise money for the next elections. So to that extent, it is unethical. Otherwise, uh, short selling is fully ethical. Uh, one more question is, sir, uh, about the shell companies. There is, I think, Mauritius-based shell companies and other companies that the Hindenburg report has misrepresented or, or sort of mentioned it in their own words. Can you cover that up? That is a very interesting thing, Radha. I missed it out, but good you asked this question. I welcome this question. There are no shell companies. That is a hype created by media. because. 90% of the media professionals themselves don't know what is Shell. Now, I'll give you an example. See, first thing is, we have created, this is not something, I, I'll tell you, one of uh, when the Paradise Papers were leaked, three of my friends were in the Paradise Papers le- uh, list. And everybody is like, Are, iske paas to do number ka paisa hai, this, that, all those kind of things. And you know, what was it? He had registered a company, which was a fund in one of the tax havens. And tax havens is not a bad thing. We have made it a dirty thing. I'll give you an analogy, apologies if anybody feels offended, but if I'm going, uh, you know, if there is an actress or a starlet in uh, media and entertainment sector, we have, because of a few, you know, cases here and there, we have started branding every person in a wrong manner. That is not the case. There could be a few things here and there. I'm not denying that as a chartered accountant, as a finance professional, I don't deny that. But companies are required because what happens is shell comp- they are not shell companies. They are companies which have a specific business. Now, see, Gautam Adani is such a big businessman. He would be meeting you. He would be meeting someone else. He would be meeting Sonamji and Prasunji. Now, there are 10 people. He, every, all the businesses cannot be in Adani Enterprises. Okay. And a businessman doesn't have only one business. He has other 10 businesses because he's going around. If he's if he meets you and uh, you know you give him a business idea, you give him a few contacts and say that uh, Gautam Bhai, let's do this business. He'll open a separate company. He'll not put you into Adani Enterprises. If he then meets Sonam Ji and uh, some question comes, uh, some business opportunity comes, he will have a separate company. What we have done is, first thing is we have vilified uh, tax sevens. Tax sevens are not to be vilified. If I have to go a bit more, maybe two minutes if you permit, if you have time, otherwise I'll not extend it. But say, when I'm a global player or a global investor, I need one particular place to keep my foot on, which has an open market from where money can be sent anywhere and brought anywhere. Okay. And that is the use of tax events. And tax events are not coming out of nowhere. There is a proper planned strategy. Mauritius or Cayman Islands or, uh, you know, Malta, uh, Isle of Man, British Virgin Islands, they have all worked on a specific strategy to attract foreign investment into that country. From that country, it can go to multiple countries. So it is a very scientifically decided thing. It is not something, ke, you know, what the media has created. And if I'm meeting 100 people, I will have 100 different business ideas. Some may click and I may do something in a company. If it doesn't work, take care. why should I put the risk on the investors? And then I have my own money as well. And I'm not supposed to do only one business. I can do any number of business. We see it even as a small businessman uh, who is, uh, you know, doing a small uh, small trading in uh, Sadar Bazaar. Okay. Even he has three, four companies. So what is the problem with Gautam Adani? So that, they are all, you know, like uh, if, I, if I'm seen with some three, four girls, they separately, oh, Sumit Mehta is a very bad guy, you know, that kind of apologies for that. So that is how it is created into a wrong manner. You said that uh, because of one person, we can't brand everybody. I just have a question about one person. I believe Ravish Kumar visited Hayden 
uh, office seven times after he was fired from or he left NDTV. Ravish Kumar is useless. See, in financial markets, youngest and the smallest person has IQ and capabilities more than Ravish Kumar. So Ravish Kumar is useless in the scheme of things. Stockbroker, a smallest junior most person who is even handling the back office of uh, stock market in the share broker's office. He is more intelligent, he has more capabilities than Ravish Kumar and he doesn't give provocations like Ravish Kumar, he actually does the work. We have kind of in financial markets, you know, people have started believing Ravish Kumar is too big. If you can get Ravish Kumar on your show and if I can ask him 88 straight questions on finance, not 88, only 30 straight questions on finance and uh, stock markets and company law. He'll not be able to answer anyone, anyone. So we are over kind of believing how ah, Ravish Kumar can be part of the strategy to amplify this report, to create a media hype and controversy. But beyond that, he has no use. This is done by very smart, intelligent people, not someone in the category of Ravish Kumar. Uh, I just happened to read uh, a post on LinkedIn a few days ago by a person who was an ex-IPS and a Wharton graduate and IIT Kharagpur McKinsey kind of thing. So um, he he took that particular tweet of Virendra Sehwag, where Sehwag was saying that the Goras cannot you know, tolerate uh, India growing. So he puts an alternative kind of a, uh, argument here, which I would just take about a minute to put across to you. So he says that, uh, you know, we always keep blaming these Goras, but uh, first of all, uh, an attack on a business group is not an attack on India. That's what his words are. And uh, if so, then what prevents Nirav Modi from taking the same track uh, so second thing he says is that when these people are using terms like Goro and white people, uh, <clears throat> sorry, that's a different thing. He talks about race, but <clears throat> then he says that uh, the only thing that Hindenburg or people like them care about is making money, nothing else. And uh, so if Hindenburg can make money by shorting an American business, they will do it in a heartbeat. And uh, it neither makes them good nor bad. That is their business model. And uh, then if an Adani family member was called a brown-skinned person, I won't go into that. That's a race. But he's just saying that uh, it's it's basically something which is a business model of Hindenburg and he's doing this for money. Uh, so what do you have to say? See, shorting as a business model is not wrong. Rather, my friend, as I repeat, I'm repeating, my friend himself told his clients to sell uh, Adani at 3,800 levels. Okay. And we do it all the times. Those who have confidence in shorting, they make good money in shorting. The other part that why Nirav Modi, that is all stupid. Only maybe these kind of people who pass UPSC and have no understanding of financial markets and who have no qualifications in financial side, but they believe they are knowledgeable on every subject because they have passed UPSC exam, they will make this kind of juvenile statements. So I have nothing to say about that. His IQ itself is showing it off. Okay, so Ratta Marke IPS pass karne se koi knowledge nahi aata hai. Okay, I'm making a very radical statement and I'm standing by it. Okay, however, the point is, chalo, thik hai, Adani ko tum thoko. In stock market, when we are selling a stock, we called it thokna. Okay, chapna and thokna are two words. Chapna means kharidna shares and thokna means bechna shares. So thoko, koi farak nahi padta hai. Abhi to usko aise bhi thoka hai bahut logo ne. That is nothing wrong. The question is, chalo, destroy Adani. Hai, destroy Ambani, hai, destroy another businessman. Hai. Chalega, if you can destroy them, destroy it. There's nothing wrong in that. This same methodology can be applied to Indian rupee. What are you going to say then? And this is the problem with India's governance. These bureaucrats who are sitting in power positions of power with not even a single degree in finance and economics. Okay, they come with the degrees in language and history and this and that, and then they want to comment on financial and economic affairs. And they don't know what is the implication. Today, if this can happen to Adani, tomorrow it can happen to Indian rupee the way it happened to pound sterling and uh, ringgit. What are you going to say then? These IPS officers don't have any knowledge. They should rather believe in focusing on controlling crime instead of commenting on all the other issues. Your last point is very interesting. And I also read this somewhere. I'm just giving different viewpoints. I also read this somewhere that the bureaucrats and the government are basically, uh, you know, one of the main causes for what whatever fracas has happened. And you mentioned bureaucracy and the ministers not having any understanding. How do you see that if they had a good understanding and the bureaucracy was if efficient, how could this Hindenburg and this, this whole fracas around it could have been minimized or mitigated? This has to be something which has to come very immediately. When this kind of things are happening, what is the, uh, do they have financial intelligence? See, today we have an integrated market. Our in markets 
capital markets are integrated with the global markets. These bureaucrats don't understand this kind of very simple thing that somebody can do a hammering and they can destroy the economy. These people don't understand that if Adani can go to a level of bankruptcy, if financial institutions are targeted, this particular IPS officer doesn't even know that it was not only an attack on Adani. It was more than Adani. It is the LIC who lost. They were, LIC invested around 30,000 crores and they were on a profit of uh, 50,000 rupees at the peak when Adani valuations, uh, uh, the, you know, the shares held by uh, LIC, uh, Adani shares held by LIC was having a valuation of around 80,000 crore rupees. From there, it came down to 50,000 rupees. Who lost 30,000 rupees? It is not Adani. Forget Adani. If you hate Adani, might as well pray that Adani becomes bankrupt. But what about the LIC shareholders and the LIC policy holders who lost 30,000 crore rupees? The same with SBI shareholders and the SBI depositors who lost money. These people are foolish. They don't understand that the loss is also on LIC. They don't understand that this is a systematic psychological warfare wherein public financial institutions are put under the clouds of suspicion so that people start withdrawing money and start stop uh, stop giving money to these kind of uh, you know public financial institutions. Attack is on India's economy. Tomorrow, if they do the same to dollar, which I have said in the past as well in this talk, if dollar reaches uh, you know 150 again uh, to rupee at 150 rupees, what happens? Will these IPS officers or IAS officers sitting, they, can they manage it? This is a very sophisticated uh, speculation technique. There's sophisticated financial institu instru instruments which are used. These IAS and IPS officers and others will have to update themselves. They'll have to get educated and their degrees in language or history or sociology or biology or chemistry is not going to help them run the country. And they don't have any skin in the game. If they do worst in finance ministry, they will go to Adivasi Kalyan ministry. That is a problem. So we will have to bring in domain level experts who can act very quickly, who have the knowledge of the subject and who can advise the government that our economy can be targeted in this manner. Otherwise, we will be in big problem in the future. One last question is, uh, do you how, how important do you see uh, is the role of financial literacy and financial transparency from the government side to the citizens? How important is the role of financial literacy in the common public and how important is financial transparency from the government end towards the people and the investors and also more uh, knowledge that is distributed to the people about the financial uh, financial functioning on the private sector and the public sector towards the people so more transparency in everything i have written an article about the transparency thing india's accounting standards india's auditing standards the schedule 3 there is schedule 3 of the companies act which dis, uh, which has a whole uh, disclosure norms on how accounts have to be presented there are circulars issued by the ministry of corporate company affairs which gives details about how ex, ex, you know more and more information can be provided to the shareholders and to the general public at large uh, we have very strong CARO, that is the company's audit, uh, auditor's report order. Okay. So, uh, SEBI has also made it very compulsory for companies to uh, disclose their consolidated balance sheet because at times what can happen, in the, like what happened in Enron. And before that, even in India, it was happening that uh, we used to only give the holding uh, main company, but we are not giving the financial details of other companies. And we are not consolidating it. So if in case there is a company and they are parking all the losses in subsidiary to show it's a very healthy. If in case a consolidated balance sheet is published on the stock exchange, rather on the stock exchange's websites, which is now compulsory, we get a total picture. That company may be making profit, but losses would be parked in the subsidiaries. And they are trying to hide it. So all those gets disclosed. So our disclosure norms, our audit norms, our accounting standards are one of the strictest in the world. I've read balance sheets of other countries, balance companies also. They don't have the kind of disclosures that we have. We have one of the strictest audit and accounting disclosures in the world. And I don't have any issue on that. Government is running it very nicely. At times, it becomes very tedious for chartered accountants to find the companies. But okay, at least they are doing something for the company. At the same time, I believe what Prasunji asked about the current ratio and all. I think there is a need for financial education right at the school level. Maybe if not 10, then 11, 12, so that students get a better idea about finance, economics, taxation, and they are not swayed very easily. Today, even, you know, manipulations happen on the stock market and uh, people lose money. Like I always say, ke paan wale aur riksha wale se jab main lagu to buy a particular stock, that means sell that stock. Okay. So people believe in paan wala and riksha wala and all those friends. Okay. So and so I said. So I think there is a need for financial literacy. 
but otherwise i don't see transparency as a issue government has it has done it quite well we also have provisions today if you want to really investigate a particular company including a private limited company you can pay a small fee to mca ministry of corporate affairs company affairs and you can get all the data on what is called as roc search each and every information about the company is a public information which you can buy from roc website so the, you cannot hide anything before i ask the question i would like to highlight something that this hindenburg report they claim that they have make many citation so i was going through the report and one of the citation was a tweet made by one mp from bengal so they have cited that tweet as evidence that this is the evidence that the mp is tweeting now the tweet has been made in 2000 in 21 so 2021 and in the very next year at 2022 the the same party supremo has invited adani to bengal and they have made a bengal business summit where adani has invested 10000 crore in that very year in september adani got a port contract of 3.1 billion from bengal so they object that only modi is favoring adani and what i leave it to them so sir my question uh, question here is that you talk about uh, financial literacy and all thing i am surprised to see my friends who are, who have done their graduation in bcom so they have done bcom so they they are propagating that see this adani is third most richest person but he is paying tax very low so so they they can't compare this means they have done all this course that corporate taxation direct and indirect taxation on all this. now they are coming and saying all this all all this thing so can you can you highlight this issue sir the biggest thing is what i found very juvenile in the rankings okay is adani becoming a richest man only because the share price has gone up from yeah. richest he is now not even uh, you know he is the some 16th or 20th richest man just because the stock price has slid slided down so i think these kind of rankings i don't really give value i was in economic times and even economic times used to do a whole ranking and then there was some other group who had done a ranking and they named samir jain as one of the richest man and samir jain thereafter never came in that list whereas i believe samir jain is one of the richest man in india but his name never comes in the list and he has a legitimate business it is not like some politicians who have a lot of black money samir jain has legitimate business who has created legitimate value uh, and uh, there is a genuine cash flow what me as a gujarati chartered accountant baniya looks at cash flow so i will not lo- you know these are kind of things that uh, you know adani is a richest man richest man if uh, if tomorrow again his stock, stock prices falls he may not be amongst the 100 top man okay and tomorrow if his stock prices jumps like anything he can become a richest man in uh, in the world so what is the point in it i don't look at this second thing is he is not paying tax so the thing is whether he is doing tax evasion which is illegal or whether he is doing tax planning which is perfectly legal as per the supreme court judgment in mcdowell case has to be evaluated now people end up mistaking or confusing between tax planning and tax evasion and that is where because again in ty become what how much tax are you going to learn i don't blame them but the first thing to be read is the mcdowell judgment supreme court case, uh, judgment in mcdowell case where it is very clear that tax planning is a constitutional right of every person and person in income tax means anybody right from individual to a company to a partnership firm to a cooperative society everybody is a called a person so it is very clear i can use tax planning tools and which adani is doing in past even ambani was doing at one point of time ambani was accused that you are making so much of profits and you are not paying tax okay because he was using all the benefits he was getting under section 80 hsc ha uh, then 80 ia and all those and he was not paying tax because he was using all those benefits thereafter government had to come with mat rather to bring adani ambani within the tax net and it was not only ambani but many other companies were using all these tax benefits and then government brought in mat and that the mat also became ineffective then they had to change it so this is going to happen people will have perceptions we can't uh, what happens is also there is a anger and a animosity in the indian society against the people who get successful who get rich because being rich being businessman is being touted as a dirty thing in india and that is why all these things then spread very easily my point was that if a person share share price getting rise so that is a non realized gain unless he sell and get a profit out of i mean income out of that 
that cannot be taxed no see that is another thing promoter is never going to sell his shares very quickly he hmm. holds it the hmm. people make a statement wherein they uh, make a confusion between the company and the individual they believe that the individual has become the richest man so he has to hmm. pay maximum tax whereas it is the company which is to pay tax in his individual capacity he would be paying tax but he will pay tax on his personal income or from the income dividends that he gets from all these companies including the so called shell companies okay so called shell companies also also doing business some of the other trading business some of the other things so today i have three companies i have three companies within my banner i am such a small person and i have three companies there are also tax planning reasons there are also reasons of fund raising today if i have to raise money in a particular company i'll use one company for a particular asset in infrastructure you need multiple assets okay so this is and they have to be housed in different companies because you have to mortgage them in a cluster kind of thing it cannot happen so all those complications are also there in infrastructure business and so what happens is when i when gautam adani gets dividends and other things from those companies he on that he pays tax but how can we confuse adani companies tax liability with the share price of adani there is there is no logic in that with that sir we conclude the question and answer session and it also brings us to the end of this talk thank you very much for enlightening us and uh, not just on uh, adani and the hindenburg but on the stock market in its entirety uh, we definitely hope to see you again thank you very much namaste namaste thank you very much for having me thank you very much